Hello, everybody. Welcome to GSO Workshop. Games Go Online. This embodied voice is your host, Brandon Pham, and our special guest of today is Sean Marino. How you doing, Sean? Doing good. How you doing, Brandon? So our topic for today is best practices in hard surface modeling. But before we start, we want to thank you, 80.LV, for sponsoring the event. Hope you guys have lots of questions. Uh, we're going to do Q&A at the end, the last 20 minutes or so. So let's go ahead and begin. Sean, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're so special, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um... So I've, I've been in the industry about six years now. Um, mostly I've been working as a, a hard surface specialist. Um, and, you know, I kind of came into this industry when that wasn't really a thing before. It was like, you know, you used to be you were either a character artist or an environment artist, and, and that was about it. Um, and even back when I was in school, it was it was kind of a weird thing. You know, my, my teachers told me, you know, don't focus on weapons and vehicles. you got to do characters, environments, that kind of thing. Um, and I just said, you know what? I, I like guns. I like cars and planes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do it. Um, and that's kind of like what I focused on for a, a large portion of my, my school time. Um, and immediately after school, like someone, someone saw that talent and they were like, hey, we want you to make guns mm -hmm. uh, it was freelance job and i was just like we've got all these different companies that keep coming to us uh and you know we want you to to work on a bunch of different projects with us um so that was the start of it and then that just kind of like really picked up the interest there mm -hmm. and and just started making guns you know, it was almost like this obsession where at home i would for my personal work i would do that and at my job i would do that mm -hmm. um and so eventually I found myself at Sledgehammer where I was working on Call of Duty. And at the time that was like, you know, this is it. This is, this is gun heaven. You know, that's all that, that's all that uh, I could ever want from a job. Um, and it was really great. I got to work on Advanced Warfare uh, all the way from the start of that project until they shipped. And then a little bit afterwards, a little bit of the COD World War II. Um, and then beyond that, I, I started looking for something a little bit different. Um, I was making guns all the time, and I found that I was just like, I gotta try something else different. Like, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I can't limit myself. I always wanted to focus on personal growth, mm -hmm. uh, and so I made the decision to go to Riot Games, where I am now, uh, mostly because they offered an opportunity for me to grow in almost any aspect that I wanted to. Right. It was, you know, not just in my my craft, but in, you know, even in my my team teamwork abilities and and being able to learn new things and have opportunities that I wouldn't have any anywhere else. Um, so now my job is is not so much focused on hey I'm a guy who models things. I'm I'm more of a facilitator of like hey I can I can almost do anything that is needed of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and Riot definitely offered me the the availability to do that. Yeah, I mean it's definitely uh, like uh, I would say halfway through my career. Um, hard surface modeling, like you said, vehicles and weapon modeling became specialized, like very recently. Uh, I, I think with the onslaught of first person shooters, even though per first person shooters have been around since the 90s, right, 80s or whatever, um, yeah. it isn't until recently because that job usually was for uh, a part of the environment artist's job, you know? Yeah. It was specialized a bit, but you were doing other things as well. But now since, you know, the games have gotten bigger, like, uh, it, it's definitely uh, more prevalent even now uh, in in a non-traditional first-person studio. Like, I see it pretty much everywhere now. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, even even on third-person games, like at, at Naughty Dog, I know, like uh, for Uncharted, for example, they used to have um, their technical artist would do the, the weapons and, and things like that. I think they now might have a more specialized role in that. But yeah, it was just like, hey, this is a thing that we need. So we're going to have get whoever we have to do it, as opposed to now you start seeing tons of people, like you look on ArtStation or anywhere else where everybody's making guns now. It's just this thing that everyone really loves. And a lot of people specialize in it, and a lot of people are really good at it. Mm -hmm. and so studios start uh, focusing on that. Well, um, do you uh, have any advice to all the students out there? Usually when, uh, at least for me, when I ask, when the students are asking me, like, what type of 
portfolio they should have like what impresses you at least uh you know if they want to go in the environment if they want to do in props they want to do weapons or vehicles what what has been the portfolio that you've seen from students that you feel would be appropriate to apply with so there's a couple things in that uh one of the first things i like to use the same sort of example that i followed is do the thing that you want to do not what somebody else tells you to do um and it sounds a little bit ambiguous and, and maybe even like counterintuitive, but had had I just followed what my teachers told me and did environments, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. And I really wanted to do guns, and so I did it. Uh, I suggest the same thing to anybody else. And you know, if your thing is, you know, super hyper realistic uh, character faces, do that. Like you're gonna get really good at it, and someone's gonna want you to do that professionally. Uh, another thing when it comes to specific work that I really love seeing is when I see something new, more like that I haven't seen before. Um, it's not really frustrating, but sometimes, you know, very repetitive to see the same portfolio piece over and over again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, way back when, you know, everyone used to do the, the typical, um, for weapons at least, right. a like an M16, an AK-47, and like those kind of realistic guns that are like the standard. Um, I like to see a lot of variety, number one, and uniqueness. One of the things that I do personally when I start any personal project is I just do a quick Google on either like PolyCount or, or ArtStation, and I look to see how many other people have done the thing that I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. One, just so I can say like, hey, where's the quality bar I have to set for myself right. if I'm gonna, you know, if someone else has done this, and just if I'm entering into something that's like oversaturated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome, man. So, uh, yeah, dude, let's get right into it. All righty. Yeah, so, um, sorry, let me open up this uh, outline I have here. Um, yeah, so one of the first things I, I really wanted to cover um, is just a quick addendum to like the, all of the advice and everything is specifically why um, I decided to, to make sort of the job change that I, I did, uh, you know, even I questioned for myself when I went to Riot, um, why why there? That Like, I looked at the work that I do and I worked at the, the art that they do, and I'm like, that's not really me. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I found is I was limiting myself. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was at Sledgehammer, I knew going from Advanced Warfare to COD World War II, I was going to be spending the same three years the next three years as i had the past three years i was just going to be a production artist i was going to get a task and i was going to make a thing mm -hmm. um and that's awesome that's definitely a place to be um at a, a mid-level point in your career or even uh, you know if you're a senior or a lead that's an awesome place to be but for me myself i definitely wanted to be challenged right. um i wanted to learn from other people i wanted to be able to teach other people things that i know um, and that was one of the things that uh, really drew me to write, is it gave me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so in that, you know, some of the things I can I can sort of hop into in terms of uh, hard surface modeling, where, where I can give advice and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I get a lot of the same same questions here and there about like, you know, so I'm starting out and I want to make this gun or this vehicle or something like that. Right. Show me a tutorial on how to make that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I kind of laugh at it because when I think back to when I was starting out in the industry, tutorials were very hard to come by. Right. We had books, we had, you know, um, very small, like, amount of DVDs here and there. Um, and what I found really helped me out the most was learning not how to model a thing, but how to learn how to model a thing, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for example, it was like I had to go through a lot of exercises of like learning how to model like nuts and bolts if I'm going to ever model a car or a tank or something like that. Um, small, starting out really small, getting those fundamental skills down, and then sort of going from there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when I, when I see people starting out to model, they're like, oh, hey, I made this really awesome knife or gun or whatever. And I followed a tutorial, and then on their next thing, when they try and make it on on their own, it's not as good. Right. Um, and so, definitely, like learning the fundamentals, learning how to work with geometry, I'd say is the, the most important thing 
uh, when it comes to, to hard surface modeling. And there's so many resources out there. Mm. Like every website you look at now that is has any sort of 3D art aspect to it, you can probably find a tutorial to learn the exact thing that you're looking for. Um, but coming back to those like small fundamentals of like, hey, how do I manipulate this one shape into this other shape? Because all really mechanical uh, design is right. interlocking shapes. Mm -hmm. um, learning those shapes and building up sort of like that mental library for how things come together uh, helps tremendously in, in terms of um, learning how to model. Right. Is there a uh, false impression where uh, for someone to think that, hey, I got to model a vehicle or something like that, that I have to have some type of knowledge in that for me to model successfully? Or do you feel like it happens organically as you're doing it? It doesn't hurt to, to know about the thing beforehand, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. um, you know, f f using your example for a vehicle, I, the first time I ever modeled a vehicle, I think it was like a Hummer type of thing for... Um, for Call of Duty, I had never done that before in my life. Right. And I was just like, okay, here we go. Like, <laughs> let, let's see what happens. Um, and I found that as I got into it, it wasn't too different than modeling anything else. I just had to, number one, do the research, you know, as opposed to relying on a concept, you know, maybe I might get one concept uh, side view of, of a vehicle or a gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. The rest, I have to know what to do. And a lot of stuff can be drawn from real world. You know, I can go on Google and type in uh, Hummer, Humvee, whatever, and I'll get tons of images and I'll learn how to make those shapes work in the way that I want to. Um, one of the things I see with vehicles uh, specifically, say cars, one of the first things people do mm -hmm. is they make the, the tires right. always first. Right. And it's like you do these really nice, say it's a sports car. You do these really nice tires with the rims and, and the, you know, you model in the treads and stuff like that. And then duplicate it three times, then boom, you got your tires. Right. But then from there, it's just like, okay, now the hard part starts. <laughs> and and I feel like people go to the tires because it's 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 a cylinder. Right. You know, you bake some, break something down into its basic shape and it's a cylinder and, you know, has some, some interesting shapes in there. But at the end of the day, it's just a cylinder. And for that reason... I, when I approach something, I say, okay, what's going to cause me the most frustration? Okay, I'm starting with that. Right. Because I definitely don't want to leave that for the end because I'm going to be, I might be worked to the point of like exhaustion on something where it's just like, oh, I've been working for a week on this thing. I don't want to see it anymore. Now I have to go through the problem. Um, so I like to solve the problems first and, right. and figure out the hard things. Um, and then I can move into the fun stuff that's kind of like mindless and easy to do. Right. I think that's just a general rule of thumb that's good for any discipline, really. Like, uh, being able to tackle the biggest issues, I feel like, good, is good time management, right? You might get the easy stuff first, but then you'll save all that, what's left on so little. Uh, oh, yeah. Where you're concentrating on the hardest uh, issues. Uh, another thing that I feel like with hard surface modeling, especially with vehicles and weapons... And I, I don't know how you feel about this, too. I, I always felt like that's kind of been our answer to the character, guys, as this is, this is you know, more complicated than a mailbox and yeah. uh, a, a lot more respect uh, given for sure. Um, but another thing that I want to ask you about is that since this is, you know, most vehicles and weapons are somewhat animated, right? You're... you're mm -hmm. Is there a re more requirement for you to talk to other departments before you get into there uh, when you get a concept? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's in any production environment, you know, collaboration is, is key for anything. Um, you definitely want to be working as closely with other people as you can when you have that availability. Um, so, for example, when I was at Sledgehammer, I used to sit next to the uh, technical director and he was the guy who would set up all the rigs for the vehicles. And while it wasn't really required for me to know how he did that, I asked him to walk me through it. And I said, okay, what does it take for you to take my work and then work with it? You know, at the end of the day, you know, if you're just working on your portfolio work, it's for you to put a screenshot on a website. But when you get enter into a production environment, you're handing your work off to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so number one, they need to know what you're doing. And it's also, in my opinion, 
so nice to know what they're doing with your work as well. And so I sat down with him and he showed me, okay, here's this tool and it runs through, you know, this checklist of, of items and na names have to be done properly and phone structure hierarchy, all that stuff. And in a very simple way, taught me how rigs work. And that was incredible for me to learn because I was like, now that I know how this works, I know how I can set up something so that not only my work will be easier to work with, but that it makes his life so much easier. And then he can do that, you know, down the road. Um, and then once I found out that I could do that, that I, I had that knowledge of how to rig, I started taking it upon myself and said, hey, next time I uh, do a vehicle, I'm going to give this to you already rigged because it's a simple process. Right. Um, that's That was definitely one of the things where you know, working very close with somebody else, I was able to figure out a way that we could work together mm -hmm. and I could potentially even take on some of his work. Right. And not, and more importantly, not cause more work for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Because when, when you have like a back and forth of things, it can just get kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. And while, while I do say like, you know, if you are a specialist, you definitely should specialize. But any amount of work that you can do to help somebody else that's going to be whether it's a rigger animator or anything like that if you can do that they're going to appreciate it so much so i have a, a two-part question for you um mm -hmm. so hard surface modeling of course um you were mentioning before one of the number one thing you would see a lot of uh a lot of students would do first would be the tires right that's the common mm -hmm. thing that you would see is there any yeah. other thing that you feel like students make a mistake of when they first get into it, not just students, but professionals as well, who's starting to get into hard surface modeling, uh, common mistakes, common problems. And second part of that question, uh, mm -hmm. is that, uh, the flip side, you know, you go on an art station, you see a ton of quality work, what stands out, uh, nowadays. So for the first part, yeah. in, in terms of, uh, mistakes, I, w I would say, um, it's not so very common anymore, but for hard surface modeling specifically, there was this, you know, overused famous picture of um, proper edge widths on an object. Um, and, you know, it was zoomed out and to the point where, like, as you zoom away from a model, your edges start to pixelate. Mm -hmm. And every time somebody would post something for the first time, hey, this is my first uh, gun or whatever, someone would just throw that in as a response. And it's just, hey, make your edge widths bigger. Um, as we get more HD and higher, you know, fidelity textures and, and higher resolutions, that becomes less of a problem because you can bake at higher resolutions. You don't have to worry about it as much. But that's still a thing that I feel like uh, people should know, uh, mostly because a lot of production environments for games uh, don't really support that yet. Uh, one of the things I see on ArtStation a lot is someone's like, hey, I did this really awesome uh, gun and, you know, it's 100,000 tries and it's got 4K textures and here it is in Marmoset or Unreal. And I say to myself, I'm like, that's not really a game asset. That's a film asset. Right. Um, and even, even if it's a low poly thing, still having like 4K textures mm -hmm. is not something that happens in games. Like maybe if you're working on Battlefield 1 and you have something for like the high end kind of thing, that'll be present, but otherwise not really. Um, so it's definitely good to see when someone would say, hey, I've made this really optimized model mm -hmm. uh, and it's at like a game uh, specs. So you have like a 1K or a 2K texture, something like that. Um, sort of like meeting standards. Now, if it's just for a portfolio piece and it's just like, hey, I wanted to make cool art, no problem. But if it's for someone who's trying to get a job, they need to show that they understand the basics of what is required in a game development environment. Awesome, man. So uh, another good question uh, that I'm seeing is that, you know, you were mentioning, um, like one of the things that I do as an environment artist, at least on every generation console, is I check with you guys. It's like, all right, weapons, where are we at? Uh, 70K triangles? How many How many 2K textures that you guys are making right, that right. I can't afford for, for whole levels? So where are we at right now for PS4 yeah. uh, and uh, current consoles? So some of the crazy like numbers I've seen recently uh, is I think from the last Call of Duty, uh, Infinite Warfare, 
some of those guns were about 70,000 triangles mm. uh, and maybe a couple 2K textures. I think right. textures is still still one of those things where it's not not quite up there. You still have to be pretty smart about like where you put all the detail in the textures. Mm -hmm. But for a first-person game, consider when you have a first-person game, the gun is taking up 30% of your screen. It should have a lot of that attention and love that it deserves almost, you know, a lot of character artists and weapon artists get in this uh, debate a lot is like, which is more important. Um, ultimately, it, it's to me, whatever's on the screen the most. And and in that case is the gun. Uh, for Call of Duty, that's, you know, a no brainer. That game is all about the guns. Right. Uh, for, for another game, uh, take Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, environments is, the environments are gorgeous in that game. And the characters and, and the creatures have a lot of detail. But I really think the the focus there is like you know you get these really awesome like terrain maps and a lot of vegetation and I think that's where a lot of the um, the budget goes and so it really just depends on the project. Cool. Well, um, another thing that goes a lot in our sector of the game development cycle mm -hmm. are that well, especially for weapon vehicles and you know characters get it too and environment guys get it too. There's a new program that comes out every week, it seems like, right? So uh, yeah. can you explain at least how relevant and how up-to-date you have to be with that? And, uh, you know, what, what type of software, if you only had to pick two or three, would you go with if you uh, want to do your job properly? So for anybody learning 3D uh, or for, for anything um, to be in the games, film industry, whatever, um, absolutely the core programs to know is whichever Autodesk package is most appropriate for you, uh, either Maya or Max, and Photoshop. With those two things, you can do everything. Uh, it's not going to be as easy as it is in other programs. Uh, but like you were saying, something new is coming out in either, you know, I see all the time, Blender, Moto, uh, Fusion 360, all these things are like, oh, we've got these like new Boolean features and it's this, <laughs> you know, everybody's basically doing the same thing and they're like, what the hell, Autodesk? Why are you guys not catching up to this? Ultimately, you know, Maya, Max, whichever your studio may use, at the end of the day, that's what you're going to have to bring the software back into. Mm -hmm. It really helps if you know that software. Right. Um, and so for, for me, you know, this may, may show, you know, a little bit dating of, of my, how up to date I am for new software. While I do know about all of the new software that's out there, I don't really think it's that useful for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I still use, I'm on uh, Maya 2014. Um, it's still super buggy and I deal with it, but I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, and I use Substance Painter 1. Um, I never found the need to upgrade to 2 because I still get the same job done. Mm -hmm. um, it goes to show that you don't really need to use the latest and greatest that's out there uh, in order to get the job done. If you're gonna, if you want to get it done faster, absolutely mm -hmm. learn those programs. Um, but in a production environment, I just find I'm like, I'm just gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna use these things that I already feel very comfortable with and can get things done in a fairly decent amount of time. Sure, if I learn a new software, it's gonna might speed up my production workflow and that might be awesome but i think what i have now works and i would say it's it goes back to that thing of like learning those fundamentals um you know if i if i rely entirely on a program like fusion 360 mm -hmm. to to learn how to boolean one shape into another mm -hmm. but then i have to go back into maya and clean it up or retopologize it afterwards it's one of those things where i'm like if i knew how to model that right in the first place i wouldn't have this problem right um so it's it's yeah, I, I definitely stick with with some of the the basic software packages just for that, um, and you know there are there are tips and tricks or, or like features, especially tools that people release now to make things like that a lot easier. Um, you know, different plugins for Maya. People are trying to find like ways to mimic some of the Boolean software or like edge um, edge adjustment uh, programs or plugins that people have for Maya and Max. Uh, and it's it's always coming out, you know, with with new things like you said. But yeah, just knowing those basics really really helps. Yeah, I wonder if you uh, have any uh, extra perspective on this. Like, 
you know, it's great that we have Substance, it's great that we have Quick, so we have all these programs that are making texturing in particular so much easier than ever before. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if students or, or professionals remember when it was just Photoshop, uh, yep. just that layer stack alone will kill us. Um, yeah. Is there any concern that you feel? It's not like we're going to have a nuclear holocaust when it comes to new right. software, but for some reason, Photoshop is your only thing, right? Do you feel like mm -hmm. it's important to a student or a professional to still be able to create textures with just that program? Absolutely. I mean, as these new programs come out, they are, in some some cases, limited in what they can do. Mm -hmm. um, in Photoshop, that software has been around, or I've been using it at least since 2003. It's mm -hmm. probably been around since earlier than that. And you can do almost anything imaginable to a 2D image. Uh, in Substance, you're limited by what they give you. And what they give you is very much tailored towards film and uh, game production workflows. And so, you know, there was a long time when Substance first came out where it's like, you can't even make text that, you know, that's added in now. It's wonderful. Um, but it's those kind of things where it's like, if you're an early adopter of any of these new software packages and you're just getting on the hype train, mm -hmm. you might find that it's missing some of the things that make your life easy. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I hear this a lot, right? About the T-shape. Do you mind mm -hmm. kind of going over the importance of that? Being T-shaped? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a term that I picked up uh, at Riot. It's, it's one of the things that they say all the employees uh, you know, should strive to be is T-shaped. And it basically means you're capable of more, doing more than just a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I spoke before about how when I was at Sledgehammer, I learned to rig. Um, that's an example of me being T-shaped. I can now model and I can rig. Mm -hmm. um, you you do more than is outside of your job. And ever since I sort of adopted that, I was just like, I was striving to do more and more all the time. Um, when I would look at some of the work that I was doing, I would see just a model that was on a background, just flat background, mm -hmm. and it's just kind of floating there. And I wanted to learn to do more with it. I wanted to learn to rig my assets to maybe pose them in a way that is different. Um, learn to do environments that, you know, still meet the same standard of, of work or of quality, but use a different workflow. Right. Um, e even sculpting, you know, is something that hard surface artists rarely do. Learning if I need to add anything organic, I can hop into ZBrush and start sculpting something. Um, being T-shaped in terms of just art is incredible because the more you learn about different art aspects, the, the better your special uh, specialty is going to be. But where I extend that is uh, to technical work as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so currently, um, with my day-to-day -day job, I do things like uh, tools. I, I will write very basic Maya tools just to make my life or somebody else's life easier. Um, with... Uh, engine workflow, if, if the studio that you're working at has an engine that you can actually dive into, um, knowing how that works and being able to work inside that engine, uh, again, will, will sort of just level you up and, and make you so much better of a developer. Mm -hmm. And so I bring that back to my personal work, and it's like, okay, so I was limited before in, you know, just making art, but now if I wanted to make a game, I could totally do that. I can download Unreal or Unity or whatever, and now I can start going into potentially some code or Unreal offers a, a visual scripting language that you know you still need the same code sense to know. Um, but now I'm not limited by the things that you know I was specializing in before. Now I can I can branch out and do more. So speaking of branching out and doing more, uh, it seems like everybody, who works in the game industry, there seems to be uh, a timeline of when it's uh, good to be specialized and then it's when it's good to be generalized and, and know more than what you're good at. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like there's a, is it um, part of being a student or part of being more and more professional? Is that that type of thing when you get more and more uh, becoming more and more a veteran in the industry that you should be more uh, 
at least alert with what's going on around you in the other disciplines. Yeah, no. So I, I'd say it's almost like a bell curve. You know, you start out um, as a student and the world is open to you. Like I, I've heard stories from students where they're like, oh, I wanted to be an illustrator and I found myself in animation because I just really like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say as a student, learn as much as you possibly can because mm -hmm. you've got nothing but time to learn mm -hmm. all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, the closer you get as a student to finishing up your schooling or the closer you get to, to going after a job, that's when you're going to start to specialize because you're like, I need to be able to do something really well that someone is going to want to pay me to do, basically. Um, there are generalist uh, roles at some studios, even like smaller startup studios have a lot of generalist roles. Um, but more often than not, you see people say, hey, okay, I've done this thing. I started character art or environment, and now I'm you know, coming back to this and that. And now I'm really going to focus on this one thing. Um, and then that's usually what you end up getting your job in. And from there, you're just focused on that for a long time, mm -hmm. always trying to get better. One of the, one of the not fears, but um, potential dangers of getting comfortable with your work is you're start, again limiting yourself if you end up just doing the same thing over and over without like striving to get better at the thing that you're doing somebody else out there is going to and and that's the, kind of the thing is like you're always competing with yourself and technically against everybody else out there in the industry it's not to say that if you don't keep up to date you're going to lose a job or someone's going to replace you but it gives you that one up if you want to move to a new job or something like that, having that specialization really helps you uh, just stay on top of things. As you get further in your career and more comfortable with knowing the things that you know, you know, being always at that super high production bar um, or quality bar, then you can start to branch out, um, start to learn new things and, and try and expand in ways that you can't, because at some point you're going to hit a ceiling. It's like, I can I can be the greatest character artist in the world, and still think that I'm gonna learn a little bit or know that I'm gonna learn a bit a little bit just by doing more and more. But those gains are gonna be small percentages versus let me find something new to to tackle, and now let me just start leveling that skill up. All right, man. I think it's time to show some of the goods. Uh, I'm sure if they haven't already, uh, would love to see some of your stuff and kind of like. The thinking behind it, like well, how do how do you exactly choose, with your limited time, or what to work on next? Yeah, definitely. So let me uh, share my screen with you. I can show you some of the stuff I've got. Uh... Ah, here we go. So do you see the shotgun model that's up here? Yep. Alrighty. Let me close this. Um, so this was a, a recent model that I did, maybe within the last year or two. Um, and again, when I started working on something like this, the first thing I did was I Googled what type of shotgun this is and put the words, you know, 3D and, and maybe like poly count or something next to it, just to see how many other people have done it. Mm -hmm. And it came up pretty short. Not a lot of people really had done it before. Nice. Um, and so I was like, okay, cool. This is going to be a, a project that I can really get behind and, and you know, work on because I want to do something unique. Uh, so anytime I approach a model, my, my workflow is actually a little bit weird. Um, I work back and forth between, you can see I have both Maya and Max open here. What? Um, yeah. So, so the reason I do this, uh, and I can open up the, the same file here in Maya. Um, so when I start working on something, I just want to get, you know, sort of the, the, not necessarily difficult part, but the part that's going to take a long time out of the way. And so like with every hard surface model, that's blocking in the proportions. Uh, and you can see here, this is super simple in terms of blocking things in. Um, and this was just the first iteration I think I have you know, up to about, here we go. There's a little bit more detail in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so at its core, this is it. You know, this is the whole gun. There's not really much more that's needed. Sure, I can add like nuts and bolts and, and you know screws and stuff everywhere, but a lot of that information is already there. 
And the way I approach a model anytime I, I tackle it is get the basic shapes and just the bare necessities out of the way. Um, kind of like what I was telling you about with vehicles. It's like approach that hard part first. And and to me, you know, the hard part of, of making any asset is looking at it fully visualized. I could have spent time, you know, working on this grip here, getting it all the way up to its final quality, and then I would have had to move to the stock and then move on to the next. And it, it's kind of this thing where if I can take a step back and look at the whole thing um, and just evaluate from a silhouette perspective, say like, hey, that's the gun. It, I did it, you know? And from there, you know, I can kind of move forward. And the reason I stay in, in Maya here, and you'll notice, you know, for anyone who who regularly models will notice this geometry and they're going to start screaming about all the n-gons and, <laughs> and kind of like weird geometry that i've got floating all over the place right. um this just informs the basic shapes that i need um particularly with maya one of the reasons why i like uh, working with it so much is the workflow is just a lot faster i feel like you know using this even this widget here like i don't have to click on that widget to move things around i can freely use my middle mouse to kind of just get stuff into place whenever i need to mm. um and that works for anything um on top of that the the boolean operations which is definitely something that's almost required to know for for fast hard surface modeling now can be done again in like the flick of uh, a gesture mm. you know the fact that maya I don't have to like open up this gigantic menu, find what I'm looking for uh, to, to do an operation. I can just do a flick gesture and boom, you know, has that really easy uh, user interface to, to just start messing with shapes. Um, and so that's pretty much the reason why I use this workflow. I'll say that Max definitely has more of a dated UI. Mm -hmm. um, and while you can still have like scripts and stuff like that, I do tend to keep the program pretty vanilla mm -hmm. um just again so i'm not like limited by uh, additional resources and so for something like this you know i might take uh all pieces of this individually uh and that's why i tend to stick with the same software package is i can just say send to 3ds max uh and even if i clear this out so I'll take this piece Send to 3ds Max, and it might act, yeah, it brought the whole thing. Uh, but now I have this here, and now I can start working on bringing that up to the, the level of fidelity that it needs to be. Um, typically, if I go back to that other file, the way that works is once I have that block model, I'll set up my smoothing groups, or in my it's uh, harder soft edges, and from there I can basically apply a modifier uh, to get my edges um, and then smooth it. And that's the high poly done. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I strip all that down and it's still just that basic shape that I sent over from Maya. So this is one of those things about uh, getting a little bit faster and more comfortable with the software is, is knowing what shapes will work, uh, where you can kind of cheat it a little bit. You know, the fact that however many verts this is here on this face, uh, eight verts, you know, isn't a problem because the way that the geometry react, reacts to it when you smooth it, it works. It, it looks fine. Um, and so, you know, in certain cases, when it comes down to it, you know, modeling things in, knowing the proper ways to, like, cut in shapes uh, definitely helps. But using only what you need to. Um, I remember way back when I first started learning to model, uh, I was going through exercises, um, just a little R2 there. I was going through exercises that were like, pretty much just learning how this, uh, how smoothing an object worked in terms of working with like a NURBS cage. Uh, and, and that's what it was called in Max. Um, and it was basically, you know, you have this final asset that looks smooth, but you're working on geometry that is still very basic and so you can start to to figure out how to form really awesome shapes Say you're making like a sci-fi like ship uh i don't know something still working with super basic uh geometry 
And if I need to cut a hole in there, you know, I used to have to do the thing of like, you know, getting my cut tool out and, mm -hmm. and getting that hole properly aligned. That's where some of the, the new features and tools really help now is like being able to come, come in and just cutting a hole in something. Sorry. Being able to cut a hole in something like that and not having to worry about the fact that you might have some stray edges or, or something laying around. And a lot of the workflow is still the same as when you were doing using that old cage. It's just now figuring out, okay, if there's smoothing errors or something here, how do I deal with that? Um, going back to, again, you know, what it was like uh, sort of learning the software for the first time, or what I see from students now, sorry, is like a lot of people haven't really encountered problems uh, with their models in terms of like, hey, I made this thing and it doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. um, that happens to me all the time. And it's just like, oh, something was left behind. I, I overlooked this one piece. And when I apply the smooth modifier to it, it just looks off. Um, I've gone through so many errors and issues like that in the past that I pretty much know how to fix almost anything that I encounter. Um, and I feel like if, if you haven't gone through that and you don't know how to manipulate the geometry in a way that works uh, the best f uh, for the shape to, to smooth properly, then you're, you're going to be stuck on those things for a while. And that's where you have to start turning to like the forums for help. And that's basically what I did. I'm just like, hey, this thing is wrong. I don't know what to do. And I go on a forum and someone's like, oh, it's this simple thing of like you didn't smooth it properly or you have an edge ver uh, two edges welded to each other or something like that. Um, so the beneficial part about working this way, um, in terms of like keeping your block model and smoothing it is before I talked about, uh, edge widths and, and having consistency, um, you know, this, you know, sort of shown here, as I start to zoom out, you can still start, you can still see that this edge is pretty cl clearly defined. It doesn't go away. Um, you know, maybe when you start to get here, You'll still see, you won't see the edge anymore, but you get that plane breakup and it still reads. Um, one of the key features that I use, that I stick with this version of Max for is for that modifier quad chamfer, where I can throw that modifier on here and I can tell it how much or little I want my edges to be. And so if I was making something super high fidelity, I might have very sharp edges like that. Um, but in the case of a game asset, keep it a little bit looser. With Max as well, I can do this globally. Um, so for anything, you know, you can see this is italicized here. With any asset that I want to, I can instance this uh, modifier and I can have it affect multiple things. Um, so as I turn things, oh, those guys share here. So there you'll see everything that's sort of going all uh, bubbly uh, shares that same modifier. And so now I can come back in and say, oh, I want to tighten that up a little bit or loosen it a little bit. So it makes this part of the model, which is essentially like your high res making the, the hard, the real like shining piece of it, um, a lot less tedious. You know, I'm not coming through and with this model, you know, manually cutting in these edge loops like I have, I used to have to do in the past. Um, but that being said, having gone through those exercises and knowing what are the proper ways that edges need to flow in order to smooth, you know, I can still go through the, the process of, of knowing how to get a smooth edge like that. But now instead, I just use this tool to do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's pretty much the same workflow I stick to for, for all hard surface modeling. Um, well, this definitely is very weird, like you said. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. you're the first one I've ever seen having both Max and mine, but why not, right? They're owned by the same yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. And, and the hope is one day that they will make one software package that we can all use together and not have to worry. <laughs> Was this discovered through frustration or did you see another artist that influenced you to work this way? So I actually started learning in uh, 3D in Max first. Um, I was a Max guy in, in college. And then when I came out to uh, my first job in California, 
the studio that I was at didn't use Max, they used Maya. And so I actually had to, to learn uh, how to use Maya in the same way that I already knew how to use Max. But then once I was comfortable enough in Maya, I was like, okay, there's some things that it can do that Max can't, but there's a lot of other things that I was used to in Max that Maya can't do. And so I found the way to just go back and forth. And it's those little those little things like like understanding you know sort of the the fast workflows and the flick gestures and things like that within Maya that make me stick with it for for the fast phases of things. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm just like, all right, we're just going to start adding in detail. And this again, this is almost like a mindless process where I just I throw something in there, put a, a modifier on it, and then call it done. Then I, I turn back to Max. And because the send to feature, they're so interchangeable that at this you know, with that feature, it doesn't really make too big of an issue. So you were mentioning before that, uh, you know, whenever you run into problems, you would go to forums and ask those guys, do you have a, a favorite resource for feedback, for inspiration, uh, sites that you want to uh, call out here to kind of help the, the professionals and students that might be frustrating as well? Frustrating yeah, definitely. Problems? So for, um, let's see. So on Polycount, I will say is, is definitely like one of the number one places where I got a lot of my resources. Um, you know, I started out just posting something, looking for feedback. Uh, when I was a student, I got no responses and it felt horrible. Um, and, but, you know, I persisted and I was just like, I'm going to keep you know, using this website and finding as much as I can. They've come a long way. They they definitely add, have a lot of new features, which is awesome. One of the things that still remains, I believe, is uh, this one thread called "How You Model Them Shapes." Uh, it's yeah, it's it's a weird uh, name for a thread, but and you know, people have Maya versions of that. I'll see if I can just do a general search for that. Or maybe it's how the f do I model this now? They might have changed that. <laughs> um, but you can see here, there's a, there's 153 pages right. of of people going through, the, like, hey, I don't know how to do this, and you know, this goes back from 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if I go to something more recent, you know, simple stuff like this, like, hey, I want to cut a square in a cylinder. How do I do it? And people are still trying to figure that out for the first time. Um, and so this is an incredible resource. You, you have stuff as simple as something like this to as complicated as putting edge loops on a gun so that it smooths properly. Uh, more often than not, you can find the kind of thing that you're looking for in terms of hard surface modeling in this thread. And if you can't, you post it and someone will help you out. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely posted it here a ton of times just being like, hey, I'm really stuck on this thing. How do I do it? And this sort of just what I was saying is like everybody goes back to basics and says like this is the the way that you need to put your geometry so that it'll smooth properly. Uh, one of another one uh, incredible resource that I would say you know is a lot easier to digest. Number one because it's not 153 pages um, is a video that I saw back when I was in school and I still think it it holds up um, was hard surface essentials. by Grant Warwick. Um, I believe back when I was in school, this guy was working on the Witcher series. Uh, I'm not sure what he's up to now. But but this video, yeah, even seven years ago, goes through some of the most basic things. And it's just like an hour and 28 minutes, an hour and a half. You're going to learn so much from this that you can carry with you to almost any project. And I, I still, every time, I think he has a section here on making like a, a six-sided like bolt head. Um, every time I, I still make like a bolt head, I think back to this video and I retain all of that information that I learned. Nice. So definitely, I would say those two are the best resources that I have. Do you have uh, any real time, maybe a Slack chat or Discord that you interact with or? Is it all just um, these awesome forums? Yeah, it's just the forums. I used to be involved on the Skype channel for Polycount. Um, but no, actually, since Discord has come out, I haven't even considered that. But 
uh, from time to time, you know, I'll, I'll hop in maybe a Google Hangouts or something like that, and uh, and and you know, work and talk, you know, as mm -hmm. with a bunch of other people that are there. But yeah, I haven't even considered doing Discord channels. That might actually be a great thing to do. Yeah, like a Game School Online Discord channel or uh, <laughs> eighty dot LP. <laughs> Anything. Yeah, yeah, would work. Uh, but uh, we're. We're at that mark where uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions, and there's quite a few already. I'm going to try my best, everyone, to go through them. Uh, just go ahead and post them in any uh, way uh, while Sean is going Matrix on us on the screen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you pe there's people watching on YouTube, people watching on Twitch, and as, uh, as well as the Facebooks. So uh, awesome. I'll try my best as we go yeah. through them, guys. So uh, here's a question from uh ian uh what would you say is the best way to increase in skills and knowledge in modeling like do you think it's most useful to just model as much as you can or is it important to watch videos and look for new techniques so both are valuable i would say doing is much better than watching uh you're going to learn a lot more that way uh the more you do the more you're going to know uh back when i was in school you know i i was learning how to draw and one of the teachers uh said to get really good at drawing hands you need to first draw a hundred and those hundred are going to be really bad and then you're going to draw a hundred more and they might be a little bit better and a hundred more and then you keep doing that over and over until it's really good um it's it doesn't take that long usually with hard surface models uh i don't think i've had to model hundreds and hundreds of things but the more you do, the better you're going to get. And I would say when doing projects, find something that's small and reasonable. You know, you don't have to launch into this gigantic, you know, destiny sized sniper rifle that, you know, has all these int intricate parts. Find something simple. Find something real world, even, even if it helps if you have an object with you that you can look at and rotate around and make it. And then you don't even have to use it as a portfolio piece. Put it aside, make something else, and just keep doing that as exercises. Mm -hmm. Here's a relevant question that I get a lot from students, too, and hopefully you can uh, put the nail on that coffin. So uh, yeah. this is from Praveen. Is okay. weapon vehicle art position, is it a realistic choice for people who are new to the industry to aim for? Absolutely. It's, it's just as viable uh, as a character artist, environment artist. A lot of people will say... It used to say, if you couldn't make it as a character artist, just do environments as a fallback and then maybe work your way into characters. Mm. Um, you know, that's not really a thing that I see most people doing now because I feel like a lot of people specialize in the thing that they're trying to do. And and for weapons and vehicles, that's totally a thing. I would say, like, don't even try falling back on something else. Just go straight for that. And, and I've seen uh, associate level, especially, you know, at Sledgehammer or other studios where I just like look at people who got new jobs, associate level um, weapons and vehicle artists getting hired all the time. Awesome. So uh, here's another question as I pull these up. Uh, so in terms of T-shape, so this is going all the way back uh, in the 30 yep. minute mark, uh, to mm -hmm. what extent should artists learn and practice 2D or concept design alongside 3D? Yeah, that's actually a really good one. Um, ultimately, it's up to you, whatever you're comfortable with. You don't need to learn to be the best um, 2D artist. Uh, for me personally, what I can say is I had almost no 2D skills when I started my, my first industry job um, in terms of drawing uh, weapons. As, that, as time evolved, I wanted to get more, not fundamental drawing skills but more of a design sense um and a lot of that sort of helped along the way it's like if i knew how to put lines on paper that that skill itself isn't going to necessarily need to be good but if i if the design sense is there and i can actually like pull from from something that makes sense as i'm drawing it it'll it'll end up working out really well in the end um so i would say you don't have to be an incredible 2d artist uh but knowing some basic 2D fundamentals definitely helps, but it's more important, I think, to, to know fundamentals of design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I've never worked for a VFX company before. I've only worked for games. Um, so I can't speak too much to that. From what I hear uh, about VFX companies is that the timelines are a lot harsher than they are for games. Um, you know, for an example, for a gun I would make for, for Call of Duty, that would take from start to finish maybe three weeks to a month. Um, I don't know if it, I think it might be faster, say you're making a vehicle or something like that for, for a film, like if you're working at ILM or something like that. I'm not entirely sure though. Uh, so you're going to get noticed, and that's going to be the number one way that you're going to get a job, is if you have experience, you, you do the work, you put it online, and you don't have to be super vocal about it. You can maybe post in ArtStation, post in Facebook groups. Um, when your work is good, people will notice, and, and that's almost every starting job uh, I see happen, uh, myself included, is from just posting your work and someone's going to see it and they're going to be like, hey, I have a need and you feel that need. Um, so yeah, just in the beginning, you know, I would say post on a lot of places. I used to do it, you know, overabundantly where I would post on like five different forums and, and different chats and things like that when I was a student. Um, it's not entirely necessary, but it helps just to get you more visibility. But yeah, definitely uh, as you're as you're making more work, for sure, just be sure to, to put it out there and let people know that you exist. Yeah, sorry, guys, I was a little muted back there, but that was a question from Ron. He was asking if he's working outside of the industry. He's a 3D artist uh, trying to break in. How would he do it? So that was the question for that. Uh, Alejandro, he's asking, uh, what kind of problems do you have to solve in production that are not widely covered in schools or basic training? Hmm. So in terms of modeling uh, itself, I would say definitely doing something under pressure is one of the things that you're only going to experience in a job. And by that, I mean, you have a deadline. You know, you might in school, you know, have a project that's due on a certain date. And for that, you get a, a grade. Uh, it's about an A or an F at that point or whatever uh, grade scoring system you have. But ultimately, it's your job when it's in a, in a production uh, setting. And so it's just like, hey, you might be tasked with this asset and typically, especially if it's your first job, it's probably going to be a lot faster than what you're used to. Um, and meeting those production deadlines is something that like, it just never stops. It's for as much as you commit to something, you're always going to have to put in so much work, so much more work than you thought was going to go into it. And that's why they say, you know, you can spend years and years and years working on a project, but you're always going to crunch in the end. It's just because things creep up time flies and usually trying to meet those deadlines is, is probably the toughest thing uh, to get used to. So we're almost at the hour mark, but we'll take in probably a couple more, right? A couple more questions sure. before we call yeah. it a night. Uh, one question is uh, fan art, right? Is it valuable? When should you do it? When should you not do it? Help me out. Uh, so from experience, if you're a fan, show it. Like, I, in my personal work, I've told myself I'm gonna do almost nothing other than Star Wars. I mean, you can see I even have a Star Wars shirt here. Mm -hmm. um, I I love Star Wars. I do tons of Star Wars fan art, and I feel like anyone who's super passionate about anything, if that's how you want to express what you're doing, go for it. Even if it's modeled after something. Um, from a game that you like and you might happen to want to work at that company you know a lot of people say if i want to work at blizzard i'm gonna do world of warcraft style art go for it do do tons of that and just really immerse yourself um for sure don't limit yourself by only doing that but if you want to focus on only doing fan art then do fan art it's a lot to draw inspiration from uh so we <laughs> so i guess ryan just joined he's like all right so to reiterate what what do you do at riot how do you get the job what do they generally look for i guess just asking what 
what's funny is what was interesting too right it's really known for a very certain style right obviously mm -hmm. you were coming from a hard surface sledgehammer call of duty that's your thing yeah um we won't we don't have to go into it too much but like uh sure yeah. yeah i mean so the the way i got my job at riot uh was because i knew people who work there um people i had interacted with in the past either uh friends that i had met or or just people i had met you know at a, at a poly count or gdc meetup or something like that uh and they asked me very like tentatively at first they were like hey we have a curiosity if you would even consider wanting to work here uh, because they knew the same the same thing you said is like i come from a hard surface background and it's like it might not be for me but what they have to offer might actually be and that's what i found was the growth opportunities the the ways to branch out and and sort of um be able to learn new things that i never knew before and and be in positions that i typically wouldn't have been able to be in at a company like sledgehammer or or any other company where i would specialize in something so specifically you know for my job like i said i spend some time modeling i spend some time doing design i i rig i do technical work i do engine work it's kind of really up to me what i want to do um and that level of growth opportunity it was incredible and and again like the way that i got that job was mostly just because someone you know saw that i had that that curiosity to, to learn and grow and they asked me great okay one last question all right and all right even i'm curious about this one so okay. uh when it comes to destruction with hard okay. surfacing how okay. do you guys handle it nowadays so do you mean destruction in terms of like say you get a vehicle and you blow it up exactly. i imagine yep yeah so that actually used to be uh, part of my job at Sledgehammer was, you know, I was responsible for making the vehicles, uh, both the destroyed states and and the clean states. Um, so the way you obviously start out is with the clean model. Um, you get the whole thing, you know, nice and pristine. And there's two ways you can go about it. You start by adding in extra geometry and just really pulling it and pushing it all over the place and just kind of like say it's a, a, a car that got blown up you'll pull the door out and maybe like you know put, cut into the glasses if it had exploded out and then the texture treatment as well is where you just start going adding in like burn marks or scorched areas or you know all kinds of crazy things and really just warp and deform it uh, i haven't found too much of a need to for a vehicle that gets destroyed so say it's like you know a, a car that can can go from pristine to destroyed i haven't found a need to like go into zbrush and start like modeling in all of the destruction things like that if the asset is meant for that uh say it's like a prop that of you know a, a motorcycle or something like that that's like banged up and kind of rusted and on the side of the road and you want to go into zbrush and do all that like nice sculpting sort of organic destruction detail go for it but normally i always find it's best uh on a transition asset to go from that nice clean version uh and then destroy it later and, and you know i had to do tons of that for call of duty before all right and that is our hour for the uh, gso workshop uh all righty sean Thank you so much for doing this. How do having. I get more of you after this? Like, is there stuff that I can visit, like an art station of some sort? Anything? Yeah. Like, anything like that? Yeah, definitely my art station. Um, my art station is, is, you know, I keep it fairly up to date. I'm always trying to like outdo my last portfolio piece. Um, so I, I post on there a lot. I have a YouTube channel that I kind of anytime I find out something new like a new technique or or something like that, I tend to record it and put it down, not for other people's knowledge mostly, but also for myself, just mm -hmm. so I can go back to it. Um, so if you search my name on YouTube or on Vimeo, uh, I have uh, a few videos that I've uploaded there, just like, not necessarily tutorials, but just like quick little like tidbits of like, hey, I just learned how to do this thing. Um, and and of course, on Facebook, I'm I'm active, uh, posting my ar artwork in the Ten Thousand Hours group and and other groups like that. So you know, feel free to to look at uh, my Facebook in those groups as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, thank you for everyone that's watching. 
you know if you haven't figured it out this is game school online we want to thank you 80.lv for hosting this stream uh, we do this once every month so uh, look forward to the next one we have a lot of things lined up uh, of course check out our website uh, thank you everybody this has been fun hopefully it's been educational for you guys i'm learning a lot uh, i love hanging out with sean so any excuse to hang out with him is awesome so this is a plus so uh, everybody have a good one have a good weekend and see you guys next month. Later.